So welcome to our SPAN knowledge spot, medical and scientific highlight 2021 in desmond tumors. It's really great to see so many patient representatives from all over the world. I think collaboration and networking is one of the key factors to accelerate research, especially in rare diseases like desmoid tumors. So I think we are really on a good way. Thanks in advance for joining. For those who don't know me yet, my name is Christina Baumgarten. I'm one of the founders and board members of Sacoma Patients Euronet. Today, I will guide you through the next 90 minutes. If you have any questions in between, please feel free to raise your hand or write your questions or comments in the chat. We are here for you. Now, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Bernd Kasper, medical oncologist at the University of Heidelberg Mannheim in Germany. Chair of the ERGC Soft Tissue, Tissue and Bone Sarcoma Group and board member of the Connective Tissue Oncology Society. Today, he will present best and new treatment options for desmoid tumors. So please, Bernd. Yeah, thank you very much, Christina. And uh, re yeah, really nice to see a lot of uh, familiar faces here. And um, let me start with sharing my presentation. Okay, so what I would like to do uh, in the next um, couple of minutes to give you a bit of an overview on, on new treatment options for desmoid tumors and as I'm a medical oncologist, this will be focused uh, on systemic treatments and um, so let's get started. When talking about desmid tumors, and that is something you already know, of course, um, we are talking about a monoclonal fibroblastic proliferation, which is characterized by a variable and often unpredictable clinical cause. We are talking about an incidence of maximum five to six cases per one million of the population per year. And um, I would like to start off my talk, of course, with our initiative, which already dates back now to 2014, um, where we had more or less the problem that um, there was hardly any level one or two evidence for this disease. That means we didn't have any large randomized trials. There were only very few prospectively conducted studies. And yeah, everything was a bit of a mess, to be honest, in, in treating um, desmoid tumor patients, no real recommendations and uh, regarding the treatment management. So what we tried to do at that time together, and um, Christina already mentioned that networking is so important here and uh, working together. What we did, we uh, brought together Patients, patient advocates from uh, SPAN, from Sarcoma Patient Suronet, together with medical experts from the ERTC, soft tissue and bone sarcoma group had a first roundtable meeting that uh, was held in Frankfurt, Germany. And at that meeting, that was the first time ever we, we came together and tried to, let's say, harmonize the, the management strategy for this disease. And a first position paper came out of that that was published in 2015 in the European Journal of Cancer. Uh, by that time, we focused on sporadic desmid uh, tumors. We updated that uh, two years ago in the Annals of Oncology. And uh, a year later in 2018, we now uh, um, called us the Desmid Tumor Working Group and we went global by that time. And here you can see all the attendees um, of this meeting we held in Milan in June 2018. And um, we more or less um, brought this initiative forward or pushed this initiative forward in two ways. First of all, we had a real um, evidence-based literature search um, um, before that meeting, which was done by an external institute in Germany. And secondly, of course, we brought this um, initiative on a global level. So uh, there were not only participants from Europe, but also from Canada, USA, of course, um, North America, um, and also Asian participants. Um, 
So this was, uh, as I said, the first advantage of this um, of this uh, initiative is that we really uh, came up with a um, literature search which was done before that was done by this institute here which is based in germany and um, these were the topics we we are talking about of course we more or less covered all the uh, important things here pathology molecular genetics indications for an active treatment the available medical therapies treatment effects pain quality of life and we also had somebody um, from the EMA as a guest um, attendee at this meeting. So we also um, had a chapter on endpoint study designs and regulatory requirements, uh, which we need for desmoids. So for the pathology that is quite, uh, I will, will just quickly or briefly um, um, touch this um, quite clear that we uh, want to have a diagnosis that is confirmed by an expert soft tissue pathologist. And the second important point is that we um, gave a strong recommendation to perform a mutation and analysis, um, which is not only important um, to confirm the um, diagnosis, but also or maybe to guide the clinical workup. As you all know, active surveillance is the cornerstone in, in the in the treatment more or less of these patients and this approach is considered the first step after diagnosis in the majority of patients and in case of further progressions the treatment algorithm or the treatment is generally guided uh, um, according to the anatomical side and this is uh, that what we uh, put down in this uh, looks a bit complex but i uh, the the most important thing here is the the uh, this part, the active surveillance part, um, which is the frontline approach in the majority of patients and only in the case of a real progression, that means after, let's say, two or three subsequent um, uh, progressions, which are um, shown on MRI or CT, then further treatment is mainly guided by the anatomical location. But I would not go very much into detail here. I would like to focus now on the systemic treatment landscape uh, which is depicted here i will not cover the old uh, therapies uh, anti-hormonal therapy and chemotherapy i would really like to focus on the newer ones uh, which are definitely the targeted therapies um, which have been used over the let's say the last almost 10 years now and uh, the most recent um, uh, systemic therapies we are currently using in clinical trials are the gamma secretase inhibitors. So let's start with the targeted therapies. It has all started with imatinib, and this dates back uh, around 15 years now. That was the first phase two study from the from Michael Heinrich from the US with 800 milligram imatinib, overall response rate 16%, so quite low. And this was followed by a study from our French colleagues. Nicolas Penel uh, was the main uh, um, PI of that study, 35 patients treated with 400 milligram imatinib, overall response rate even a bit lower, only 11% and a progression arrest rate after three, six and 12 months of 90, 80 and 70%. So we have a quite low uh, response rate, but obviously the ability to stabilize the disease. And that is something we already studied or we already found in our study that we uh, performed in Germany. We also treated around 40 patients with imatinib for a period of maximum two years, and we could demonstrate a sustained progression arrest in resist progressive desmoid tumors in around two thirds of all these patients. This is also published uh, a couple of years ago and uh, was the more or less the third trial uh, which was done uh, with imatinib in the third prospective trial which was done with imatinib in these patients. The next tyrosine kinase inhibitor which was then evaluated uh, was serafinib and this of course is a very important study by, uh, by my colleague Mianel Gaunda. Um, and as you can see uh, by the fact that it's very prominently uh, published here in the New England Journal of Medicine, this was actually the first phase three study 
ever done in this disease. It's a placebo controlled study. So one, um, uh, one half of the patients received serafinib, the other half placebo. And um, as you can clearly see in this graph is that um, there was a clear um, advantage for the patients in the in the serafinib arm and um, yeah so this was more or less the main result of that study a clear advantage for serafinib and um, this was the publication which dates back now to 2018. We have another tyrosine kinase inhibitor then uh, which was tested um, from our French colleagues again in the which was called Desmopatz study, that is Pasopinib. Pasopinib is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor which is already um, registered in desmoids, or in not in desmoids, sorry, in soft tissue sarcomas. And um, our French colleagues here performed a randomized trial in the one arm Pasopinib and in the other arm a chemotherapy regimen, which consisted of metotrexate and vinblastin. The primary endpoint of this study was the progression arrest at six months of treatment. And this was about 84% for the pisoponib and only 45% for the chemotherapy. So again, let's say the, the, the winner of this study was pisoponib. So two more or less large studies with a clear advantage um, for the tyrosine kinase inhibitor compared in one study to placebo and in this study to a chemotherapy combination. But, and this is important to already mention that here, is that both drugs, um, serafinib and pasopinib, and also imatinib, by the way, do not have a formal registration or approval for desmoids and that's the reason why in many countries they are, they cannot be used because they are not reimbursed and um, in germany we can do that but it's definitely what we call an off-label use okay now i would like to shift to the other um, um, compounds that are mainly um, evaluated at the moment in desmoid tumors. And these are the, which we call gamma secretase inhibitors. They are actually targeting a special um, pathway, signaling pathway in desmoids. So let's put it like that. It's the first drug, or these are the first drugs which actually have a rational um, to treat desmoid tumor patients, uh, which was, by the way, not the case for the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, where we actually don't know why they, why they work or why they do not work. So the first candidate here, which has been tested in a very small trial, very small phase two trial, was Nirogazestat, 17 patients uh, with these characteristics. And here you can see the results of this um, trial. There were five patients with uh, what we call a partial response. That means a tumor shrinkage or a change in tumor size of more than 30%. And all the other patients um, were what we call had stable disease. That means they do not have um, a progression of more than 20% because this is this bar here. Um, so progressive disease means a tumor growth or um, of more than 20% and all the other patients were in between that, what we call stable disease. So none of these patients demonstrated progressive disease. And these quite encouraging results um, then led to this phase three study, which is still ongoing. It's a global randomized double blind placebo controlled phase three trial which is actually evaluating the efficacy and of course also safety and tolerability of neurocasistat in adult patients with um, progressing desmoid tumors. It's a one-to-one -one randomization, neurocasistat versus placebo. And these patients um, who are progressive in the placebo arm, of course, have the chance to what we call cross over. They have the chance to um, receive um, Nirogazistat in an open label uh, phase of the study. That study actually, uh, as I said, is still ongoing. It started uh, recruiting patients in 2019 in 
April, I think, or May 2019, and um, recruited around 140 patients in about one year. So recruitment stopped a bit more than one year, stopped in 2020. And um, um, but the thing is, we do not have any results of that studies as um, it is not unblinded yet. So the uh, which will as it looks at the moment, which will um, be the case in, in, let's say, a couple of weeks. But um, of course, we do not have any results of that. But we will have the top line results here, I guess, mid of this year or maybe second half of this year. So this is the first compound, uh, the first gamma secretase inhibitor, which is currently in testing. And then we have a second gamma secretase inhibitor, which is uh, from another company, um, which is called Ayala. And um, this uh, um, um, compound doesn't have a name yet. It's, it's just called AL102. And this is currently in a, in a, a phase two, three study. Um, which is currently ongoing. This is a bit more complex here, but um, there, there are two phases or two parts of that trial. So there is a first part where just different regimens of um, this um, uh, compound are compared. Um, this is part A with around 36 patients who have to be recruited here. And then the, the let's say the winner is selected here. So the most um, appropriate or the best regimen is selected here. And this regimen then goes to the, to the randomized part and the double blind placebo controlled part of the study, which is the part B. And this is again, a randomization here. It is a two to one randomization for um, the gamma secretase inhibitor versus placebo. Again, patients, uh, it's more or less the same as the other study, patients who are in the placebo arm and uh, uh, have progression, pro tumor progression or disease progression have the possibility to cross over in what we call this open label extension arm. That means they have the chance to receive uh, AL102, so the real drug. So this study is currently in that part. It's in the part of selecting the best regimen. And when this is finished or when this is uh, finalized, it will um, um, more or less smoothly go over into the next phase, um, the randomized phase. And this phase is more or less the same as the other study, which I just demonstrated. OK. Um, this is a, a summary, more or less, of the of the different studies I just showed here. These um, these are the four studies with imatinib. I uh, uh, there is one which I did not show you before. It's this one, but here are the two ones I mentioned, and this is the German one, and with more or less here, which is this is the response rate, which is varies between less than 10% and let's say maximum uh, 19%. This is compared to the, to the serafinib data um, from, from Mirnal with a higher response rate of 33% and the data for pesopinib from the Desmopat study with a response rate of 37%. And here are also the data for Nirogazistat, but this only comes from these 17 patients in the small phase two study. So here we actually have to wait, of course, for the results of the large phase three trial. Okay, then I would like to go back to our um, paper and to our recommendations or our consensus initiative. What we put down here is that, of course, uh, due to the lack of comparative studies, um, we actually do not have many comparative studies, we are still not able to propose a real definitive order um, of the existing systemic treatments. We do have randomized data for serafinib from the placebo controlled trial for pesopinib and methotrexate plus winblastin from the Desmopatz trial. So in general, what we actually do is we start with a less toxic therapy initially and then try to um, uh, yeah, followed by the more, more toxic agents. Let's put it like that. Okay, and um, for those who want to um, 
read it, uh, want to read further, um, we of course put all these recommendations and treatment suggestions in um, this um, in a paper. There is one scientific publication which has been um, published in the European Journal of um, Cancer uh, beginning of 2020. And there is also a quite nice booklet form available, also online, of course, available, um, uh, where you can uh, read this in very much more detail. This is available on the SPAN website, and it's also available on the website from the DTRF. And these are all the people from the Desmond Tumor Working Group who were involved in this initiative, um, which was actually a great initiative. And um, we will certainly um, follow up on that. But um, what we actually want to do is we would like to wait at least for the for the data from the from the spring work study from the Neurogazistat study. And this would then be the time point for um, getting together in a new consensus initiative um, to to um, talk about the where this where these treatments um, can be incorporated into the treatment algorithm and um, what we think about that. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much for your attention and happy to take any questions or comments here. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Ben, for the great overview. So we have already the first question in the chat. Um, do you ask about CKIT before starting Imatinib? Um, no, actually not, because it's uh, the um, it's uh, Desmoids do not express that, and it's uh, that's that's actually what I try to explain. We uh, we actually don't know why these tyrosine kinase inhibitors work in Desmoid tumors, and it's more or less just a trial and error uh, um, approach, I would say, and. Um, uh, that and that is the case for all of them for imatinib, pasopinib, uh, sorafenib, and um, yeah, so we do not have to test that. Okay, thank you. Um, as a physician, how do you choose TKI to start with? Yeah, the the type of TKI uh, uh, you choose uh, is, um, I would say, there are different. Um, things you have to take into account here so one of one uh, you have to look at activity it's obviously like that that imatinib is less active than uh, sorafenib and pasopinib that's at least um, what we found or what we um, yeah what we found from these prospective trials but of course on the other hand you have to take into account the side effects and which i did not go into detail in that presentation um, um, that's something Jean just put in the chat um, because they definitely do have very different side effects. And um, imatinib is, of course, very, very much better tolerated than pasopinib or sorafenib. And that's the problem with these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, especially if you take them for a longer period of time. Um, uh, they, they are they are quite toxic. They have skin skin toxicity, fatigue, and um, diarrhea. All these problems, which um, which are actually quite common there. And that's um, on the other hand, that's something where the gamma secretase inhibitors can be, of course, or are uh, we hope that are much better um, in that way because side effects seem to be less. Uh, then we see them in the with the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Okay, thank you. Um, if somebody wants to know if traditional methods should be used or new ones, what would you say? Sorry, I didn't get that. Um, um, if somebody wants to know if traditional methods should be used or new ones, what would you say? What do you mean by traditional methods? <laughs> Vandana. Yeah, so what I mean is like, you know, the earlier ones you said were uh, chemotherapy, surgery, and all those things. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, uh, yeah I, so um, anti hormonal therapies, I would say, uh, at least in my opinion, they are out um, because um, um, there is not really any um, good data for that. And we 
did not give any recommendation to use them anymore, but I know they are still used. Chemotherapy is something for um, patients with a, with a, let's say, a highly progressive, very dynamic um, uh, desmoid where you need a, a faster or a higher response there. I mean, we know that chemotherapies, the, the traditional chemotherapies we use for soft tissue sarcomas or for sarcomas in general, they of course have a higher response rate than the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And so when you need a response, when there are, let's say, um, symptoms or severe symptoms or when, when there is even a life-threatening situation, which is... Um, Fortunately, not often the case, but um, then chemotherapy might be the best to go for. But when you have time, when you uh, when it's not so urgent, which is in most of the in the majority of the cases, the fact, then TTKIs are actually um, good to choose. Okay, I think you replied already on the next question for those drugs. You mentioned how do you order them in order of toxicity? Yeah, that's some that's that's something I said. Um, I mean, um, imatinib less is the one with a with a um, with less toxicity, and sorafenib and pisoprenib are quite similar in terms of toxicity, but they are not so easy to to handle in these patient in this patient population. Okay. Do you think that cryoablation or HIFO can become early the first option for some tumor localization extremities? Yes, I mean, that's certainly a hot topic. Uh, by, by the way, also something to integrate in the next consensus meeting. Um, the data on uh, especially cryoablation. Cryoablation is, um, um, has been studied in France in a, in a very nice, um, nicely performed study. And currently there is a, a study ongoing there I mean, the first one was not a randomized study, but this study now is a randomized study comparing cryoablation uh, to um, the same chemotherapy regimen, which was also used in the Desmopat study. So it's compared with metotrexate winplastin. And um, if, if, of course, it will be very interesting to see what these local therapies can actually um, gain. Yeah, the next question. <laughs> when and where is the next consensus? Not meeting yet determined. <laughs> so that depends a bit on the on the data. I mean, we uh, first Alex uh, Alex Kronke is also, um, of course, um, uh, planning this together with me and and the group. And so the, the our first idea, of course, wa was to do it this year. Um, but um, when we we hoped that the that the uh, Springworks or the Neurogazistat um, trial data are out earlier, but this takes a bit longer as expected. So um, we will certainly wait for this data. And of course, it will also be good to have more data on cryoablation to also incorporate that. I think these would be the two main topics which uh, would be nice for a next consensus meeting. Another question, what about hormone therapy? Yeah, that's, that's I think I already answered yeah, right yeah okay any further question then a question from my side progression what does it mean exactly in the neurogasis trial yeah i mean um in in both trials um progression is defined according what we call resist is these are criteria for the radiologists and I do not want to go into details here, but a progression means, to put it easy, a growth of more than 20% in a certain dimension, whatever. And um, so for the uh, both uh, studies, the, the Nirogazi study and also the Ayala study, both studies require a resist progression for inclusion. That means there has to be a growth of the of the decimate of at least 20% when you include the patient over a period of six or 12 months. That depends a bit on the study. And um, yeah, th that's the definition. Okay. What about another question? What about fertility and TKI? 
above all Nirokasistat? Is yeah, it reversible? Very good question. That was actually um, um, a hot topic or is still a, <laughs> a very important topic in the Nirokasistat trial at the beginning of that trial. Um, that um, because they what uh, what we or what was found was that um, some patients had uh, premature menopause and um, so the trial at the very beginning was stopped uh, uh, um, or recruitment was stopped for for females um, um, but as it I mean we do not have all the data yet of course but it looks that um, um, more or less all of the cases are reversible after stopping Nirogazistat and um, and that was the reason to continue that trial, but it was stopped for for a couple of months uh, um, inclusion at the that was at the beginning of 2020 and um, we will see the results of course of that and the evaluation of that at the end of the trial, which will be very a very interesting point here. Okay, further question? Okay, if not, so I would like to move on in our program. So now it's really a pleasure to have you here today, Dr. Anna Green, the new research director from the Desmond Tumor Research Foundation. She leads the research initiative of the Desmoid Tumor Research Foundation and will present, present today the ICD code initiative. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Christina. Let me share my screen. Okay. Um, so, so thank you again for, for inviting us to talk about this initiative. Um, I'll be very upfront and codes, we're still in the middle of this process, but, but I'm going to give you an overview of, of how we've gotten to the point where we're at. Um, but first, I'd really like to talk about um, just a little bit about our foundation for anyone who isn't familiar. Um, the Desmoid Tumor Research Foundation was founded in 2005 um, in the United States, um, really to aggressively fund research um, to find new therapies and ultimately a cure for Desmoid tumors. And um, we also serve, um, serve patients um, through education, awareness, and support. And we have a lot of major research and clinical and patient initiatives um, that we've done over the years in partnership with, with other organizations as well. Um, but we host an annual patient and recent workshop to disseminate um, new research and clinical information. And we have a patient advocacy committee and we have a virtual tumor board, which is a really um, outstanding way for physicians with challenging cases to present to an international group um, of multidisciplinary physicians um, to, to chart a new um, treatment path forward. And we also have a patient registry where we follow the natural history of the disease, um, tissue donation. We have a patient reported outcomes tool that's being used in prospective clinical trials right now, um, which we're really excited um, to, to find out how well that works. And um, we've also taken part um, in the consensus paper um, that was spoken about previously, and we have a grant program, and we try to help connect patients to clinical trials as well. And so to give you a little bit more of a background on desmoid tumors, um, I know a lot of you are familiar, but, um, but I just really wanna set the stage for, um, you know, an ICD-10 code request where you need to define a clinical, um, a clinically specific disease. Um, so, so desmoid tumors um, are its own disease. These are tumors found in connective and soft tissues. Um, they're not classified as malignant because they don't metastasize, but they can be very locally aggressive, infiltrative and destructive. So as you can see in the picture, um, this is a picture of a back desmoid. Um, that's, that's very large and clearly um, painful um, for the patient. And they have a very variable and unpredictable course. And the, the incidence is um, a little unclear and this really ties back into our ICD-10 code initiative is 
you know, to, to better understand the incidence of disease. So right now it's estimated at four to six per million per year. So in the US, we estimate that about 900 to 1500 people are diagnosed with desmoids each year. Um, but we really think that this is likely underestimated due to um, you know, challenges in diagnosis. These tumors are often misdiagnosed initially, um, as well as reporting. So we think that with an ICD-10 code, we can better report on incidents of desmoid tumors in national um, databases. And so I just want to briefly mention that, um, you know, desmoids can be found anywhere in the body um, because connective and soft tissues are, are, are pretty much all over. So, so they can be found in the head and neck, the chest, upper extremities, lower extremities, abdomen, et cetera. Um, and why I bring this up is that we, um, we wanted to incorporate location specificity into our ICD-10 codes. Um, for the reasons uh, mentioned previously that um, treatment paradigms can change based on the location. And so we'd like to be able to track that over time. So, so just to give you a little bit more of a background on ICD-10 codes, these um, ICD stands for International Statistical Classification of Diseases and Related Health Problems. And these are maintained, um, the process is maintained by the World Health Organization. Um, but, but the system was put into place um, as a classification system, um, ideally used globally so that we can standardize how diseases are tracked and reported. So for example, if you go to a doctor and receive a medical diagnosis, um, you may receive a diagnosis code, an ICD-10 code. And so at least here in the US, these are used by medical institutions to track your diagnosis in you know, medical databases, it's used by health insurance companies for billing purposes, and um, these codes are used in national research databases to categorize your diagnosis and, and understand incidence and prevalence of disease. And so out of the 7,000 rare diseases, um, it's been reported that only 500 or so have disease-specific codes. And so we are one of those um, rare diseases um, in the Des Moines community that doesn't have a specific ICD-10 code. And so, so that's why we um, think it's important. So, so to talk a little bit more about why these codes are so important, um, you know, as I've already alluded to, they're really important to help understand the prevalence and incidence of disease. So it's, it can be difficult to identify desmoid cases in these population databases during research because if you query on the current ICD-10 code used for desmoids, you're gonna pull back a lot of information on other tumor types that's not specific to desmoids. So, you know, without an accurate code, it's just a lot harder to understand how many individuals have a particular disease. And we think having an ICD-10 code will help um, with sharing and comparing health information across hospitals, across countries. So if you wanna query, um, you know, electronic health records and uh, medical databases of which medical specialties are diagnosing disease or, what are changes in health outcomes after a new therapy is approved? Those research questions are much harder to answer if you can't um, query for. And you know, as I mentioned before, these codes do play into health insurance um, billing decisions. And so policies for new treatment coverage may depend on how many have a diagnostic code in their record. Um, so it may help in that regard. And just fundamentally, having a diagnosis is empowering for patients. So having a diagnosis that trickles, you know, from the physician to the medical records to the, you know, the billing system um, is, is empowering and very helpful for patients. So when we set out on this journey to get an ICD-10 code, we, we really started with, you know, talking to stakeholders and surveying um, physicians to find out what's actually being used. And so um, what we found is that um, most commonly the ICD-10 code D48.1 is used for diagnosis of desmoid. And the, the definition is a neoplasm of uncertain behavior of connective and other soft tissue. So as you can see from that definition, it's, it's a broad catch-all category for um, neoplasms um, that are not well defined and don't have codes already. So what we have proposed, and again, you know, like I said up front, we have not received these codes. This is what we have proposed. 
um, is a new subcategory. So underneath D48.1, you know, can we add um, a new code for specific for desmoid? And then additionally, under desmoid, can we add additional subcategories for the common locations of desmoid tumors so that those can be accounted for and tracked over time? And so to give you just a very broad overview of how the ICD-10 code process works, at least in the United States, um, I really like this um, graphic from the ICD code roadmap put out by the Every Life Foundation. Um, I highly recommend this guide if you're thinking of going through this process. So the, the codes are typically only updated once a year on October 1st, and the process is managed by the ICD-10 Coordination and Maintenance Committee here in the US. And so upfront, it's, it's not a fast process. Um, it's, it's a bit of a slow deliberative process because they want to get the codes right. You want to, have to you know, initially decide that you want to engage in this process, connect with relevant stakeholders, as I described, um, in particular physicians and um, familiar with the disease so that you can really compile a clinical case for why an ICD-10 code is necessary, and then submit a written proposal. And so these are only accepted twice a year in the December, January timeframe or the June timeframe. And then after you submit a proposal, you will likely receive comments back from the committee. You'll be asked to respond to those. And then ideally your topic will be added to the agenda at the next um, ICD-10 committee meeting. And those occur twice a year in March and September. And at this meeting, you will typically give a, a clinical presentation of your disease and the need for a code, like how that would be helpful. And then after that, there's a public comment period where anyone can comment on these proposed coding changes. And then you may receive comments back from the committee and ask, be asked to revise. So this process of proposal and presentation can be very iterative. You may have to go through this um, more are finally approved, they will be implemented in October 1 based on coding changes approved January 1. So for example, if you're if you present in September of 2021, your code would not go into effect October 2021. It would be the following year. So to talk about where we are in this process, we submitted our proposal in June of 2021. We um, were then asked to present at the ICD-10 coordination committee meeting in September of 2021. We received comments back that they wanted to add additional codes to our proposal and have asked us to represent next month in March of 2022. And so we're hopeful, we're taking this as a good sign that they wanna add additional codes for um, other sites on the body, um, but we do have to present again next month and then we will wait for next steps. Um, again, it's, it's a bit of a slow deliberative process, so we have to wait for the committee. And then if all goes well, we would likely have new codes implemented in October of 2023. And then after that really begins an education campaign where we need to um, help update the medical community on these new coding practices. So, so that's where we are in the process. Um, I hope this has been helpful and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot for your update. Very interesting. Any questions from the audience? So I think this is really important be because we get more accurate diagnosis um, information of desmoids um, because currently do not really know um, how many patients really have a desmoid because it's it's not so clear. So thanks for your initiative. Here we have another question. Do you expect any difficulties with implementing a new ICD code in other countries outside of the US? Yeah, I think these are really good questions um, because someone else also asked, is this classification international? and I'm not an ICD-10 code expert. My, 
my understanding is that these different countries may implement codes um, in their own way. So it is not clear to me if these codes will, will be implemented outside of the US or how they will be implemented. Um, I really don't, I don't know enough um, to say. Um, I don't know, know that Jeannie, our executive director is on the call. I don't know if you have any additional information about that. Uh, I hope some of the international people here could help us with that, coding practices and whether you use the uh, USICD codes. Um, but we have been told that it could vary from country to country. Yeah, I, I mean, at, at least there, there are variations, but of course, in overall, this classification is, is, is used in other countries as well, of course. So we are in Germany using a similar classification. There might be small differences in the different countries, but um, but of course, it would it would need to be implemented in the different countries, and this is maybe something which takes a bit of time. But in general, this is, this would of course be a, a very good step forward. And we hope uh, that you and the rest of our advisors can help us when we hopefully do get to that stage. <laughs> Yeah. And we need to implement that international educational campaign. So, so that can be a group effort. That'll be great. Sure. Another question. Are codes applied retrospectively in she patients who may no longer be treated, passed away, ETC? Again, that's a really great question. Um, I, I am not a, a medical coder. My, my gut would tell me likely not, but I, I, I don't know um, if Dr. Casper, if you could comment once someone has been diagnosed and a um, code has been entered, would, would that ever be retroactively changed? Not really, to be honest. I mean, mm -hmm. only if you look at, at then you have to look at older data and, but that wouldn't really make sense because then you have to change all the codes for, for the decimal two more patients. And uh, so, um, yeah, so I, I, I guess the, when, when it's used or when this really comes, then it's, it's something you have to implement prospectively, of course. Um, a few comments from the audience. In India, they use the same classification. And in Brazil, in order to get access to treatments, we use the C49 ICE code, which uh, stands for malignant tumor. Also, the desmoid is considered benign here. This is really. Yeah, that's, that's exactly the problem. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Dr. Casper, could I ask? Uh where you did, given this situation with the ICD code and the diversity of use or coding for desmoids, how did the consensus paper come up with a 5%, five to six per million number? I've, because I've, in past literature, we had often seen two to three per million. But yeah. the consensus paper came out with five to six per million. Yeah, we. Uh, I, to be honest, we we also got that from another paper, uh, which I, to be honest, have to look that up. But I know there are some some of the papers uh, do have um, less or a, 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 a bit lower incidence. But um, yeah, but I think we have that from a French work, to be honest. Um, but but let me check that. Yeah, I did look that paper up, Jeannie, and I, I think that they were using, um, it was a particular country in Europe, I don't remember which country, but it was looking at their health, like their health record system, yeah. and I don't think they were looking at, I think they were examining, like they weren't, they weren't just looking at ICD-10 codes, they were um, really examining the records to find people yeah. who had, you know, desmoid tumor listed, yeah. um, which is just, you know, more time intensive, like I think that's how these, you um, that the incidence and prevalence are being calculated now, it's just far more time intensive. If you could just label something as D48.1, whatever, as desmoid, you could easily query databases and get to those numbers more quickly. Okay, thank you. I think this was really very interesting and important for our community.
So last but not least, I'm really happy to introduce Professor Dr. Astagi and Rashi Kapoor from the New Indian Support Group, Sachin Sarkoma Society. And Professor Sama Rastogi from New Delhi will present the research work he's doing and Rashi Kapoor will provide an insight in the patient support group. So please. Uh, hi everyone. Am I audible? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Is my screen visible? Yes. Yeah. So I come from uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, and uh, I, I'm in Department of Sarcoma Medical Oncology, Additional Professor. So, uh, so we started a Desmoid Clinic four or five years back, around four or five years back, and now we have prospective database. Our research is mainly clinical and uh, translational. We are like starting. We are trying to start. We have regular tumor board meetings, both national and international, and we have educational uh, sessions with Sachin Sarcoma Society and patient advocacy and collaboration with Sachin Sarcoma Society. So, uh, so far, uh, we have few studies here, and in 2019, we presented the data of 56 patients in ESCO, and this year, uh, we presented health-related quality of life in people with despoid-type fibromatosis. Uh, currently, one study, Sorafinib discontinuation study is going on, which I will elaborate later. And also ringside study with gamma secretase inhibitor, AL102 is uh, going to open soon in next two months. So uh, I'll just elaborate a bit about characteristics in our population and the pattern of treatment. So this, uh, this abstract in ESCO received uh, uh, ESCO merit award this time. So what we did, we uh, the health related quality of life is patient patient's perception of uh, uh, their health in terms of physical, psychological, and social aspect of uh, their life and because of desmoid and the treatment. So uh, this being a very long, unpredictable disease with multiple lines of treatment, many surgeries, when people are uh, about to get independent and having so much stress and uh, anxiety, so we thought that it would be prudent to see all these things. So our first objective was to see health related quality of life by URTC questionnaire and to see anxiety by GAD7 questionnaire and PHQ9 questionnaire. And we compared that with healthy control, that is healthy population. This population was the staff of hospital that is perfectly healthy. So uh, we had 102 people with desmoid for this cross-sectional studies who, who consented for this study. And the median age in our population was uh, uh, 27 years. And if you see majority of people were uh, limb desmoid as happens mostly and the abdominal were around 23%. So one of the, uh, the most important thing is that there was quite a uh, very frequent misdiagnosis. And uh, since these were the patients who, were, who had misdiagnosis from outside, so as you can see, a lot of them had neurofibromatosis, nerve sheet tumor. Two patients, 60% 60, 60 of patients had some kind of treatment from outside and more two or more than two surgeries happened in almost 40% of patients, which is quite discerning. Uh, four patients had radiotherapy, which is again discerning. <clears throat> so uh, the pattern of treatment in our institute, again, as Dr. Casper said, that tamoxifen is out. Before 2018, we used to use tamoxifen, but now majority of time, active surveillance. And if a patient is actively progressing, then we use serafinib. And as you can see, we had partial response in almost 40% uh, of patients with sorafenib. Chemotherapy we use only in life-threatening disease and imatinib pezopenib in hardly few. Gamma secretase inhibitor are yet to uh, uh, be used in India. So what we found that as compared to healthy controls, our people with desmoid had higher fatigue, pain, and insomnia. 
along with that there are much higher chances of financial difficulties so the higher the score for this symptom scale is the worse it is as you can see fatigue is 15 in controls while 31 in uh, uh, fibromatosis people and the same for insomnia coming to functional scale with quality of life so uh, this is the lower the functional scale the worse it is physical role functioning emotional functioning and social functioning along with global health scale that is quality of life was again uh, uh, lower than normal in different aspects of life for people with fibromatosis coming to depression and anxiety by phq 9 questionnaire and gd 7 questionnaire uh, almost 50% of people had some kind of depression as compared to uh, or only 25% of uh, people with uh, in controls which was statistically significant similarly anxiety almost 40% of people had anxiety as compared to 25% in controls which was statistically again significant and almost 8% of people it fell into major depressive disorder so the pain and restricted movements were quite significant in almost 50% and 20% of people respectively we compared our uh, so this was the largest study with quality of life uh, cross sectional study till uh, till now as compared in compared to previous studies like desmopass study in which pezepinib was used as compared to study from royal marsden and uh, uh, other cancers the the reference for other cancers as you can see the the fatigue the pain is almost as good as uh, cancers i mean it is considered benign but the the kind of pain fatigue mas so perhaps uh, like a uh, lot of time it, it is underestimated the the burden of fatigue pain financial difficulties physical difficulties anxiety and depression are underestimated in people desmoid so currently uh, we are carrying out one study in which we are doing sorafenib discontinuation after one year of treatment and if patient has good response on sorafenib and we will see if those patients progress or not because as of now as dr kasper said that sorafenib is to be continued for for a long time and this causes significant de uh, deterioration in quality of life so uh, so far we have included almost 20 patients and uh, uh, like early follow up some patient are doing well after discontinuation of sorafenib but too early to say uh, we have soon uh, i'm very excited about gsi gamma secretase inhibitor trial coming here and i'm also uh, uh, excited about dtr thankful to lot of people for uh, for radiology surgical oncology uh, orthopedics uh, psychology and my fellows with dr vikas who did this esco study and the current fellow who is doing sorafenib discontinuation study along with that i am thankful to dtrf spain and dr mrinal gunder for his unconditional support anytime and dr aaron wees thank you uh, i'll request rashi to continue with this thank you any questions please, uh, you can please ask thank you i don't know thanks a lot for your uh, presentation any questions or should we move on with a presentation from the indian support group namaste everyone uh, so i'm dashi from sachin sarcoma society india and today our presentation is about patient advocacy for desmoid tumors uh, in india about us so sachin sarcoma society is a patient support group formed in 2018 and we had one mission to spread awareness about rare tumors like sarcoma desmoid and gist and with a clear vision to with a vision to remove the fear of rare tumors
So how this support group was formed? Uh, all the members of Sachin Sarcoma Society are either patients, survivors, and caregivers of sarcoma. At one point of time, we were all misdiagnosed and wrongly treated in the other hospital outside AIMS. We came to AIMS for treatment or for taking second opinion. We were all we have all taken treatment from our doctor, Dr. Samir Astogi. All the members have faced challenges like misdiagnosis, mistreatment, lack of awareness, no social support, administrative and logistical problems. All these challenges were faced by each one of us and we believed that we all had a vision to start something like this and we started support group and with support from Dr. Samir Astogi, we came together and we started working on spreading awareness and imparting education. So this was a very important paper that we read in our times and we felt that this paper from Spain and European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer and Bone Sarcoma Group, which clearly mentioned that there is a need for patient advocacy in our group. We were very much uh, happy to see the great work done by many organizations all over the world. And we thought that we should do something like this in our country and we formed this support group. Need to start Desmoid support group. So we, from 2018, we started working. We started going to AIMS. We started meeting the patients. Initially, we started with sarcoma, but in the meantime, we also started meeting Desmoid tumor patients. Based on our interaction with them, we felt that all these patients also had similar challenges like misdiagnosis, mistreatment, they had stress, anxiety, and they were not having awareness about their disease. We thought that along with sarcoma, we need to do something for supporting these desmoid tumor patients, and we formed their WhatsApp group. So when we started meeting them in OPD, and we started interacting with them and comes during our counseling sessions, we felt that these desmoid tumor patients wanted psychological support. As Dr. Samir Astogi has mentioned in his presentation, that these patients also need, they are in a lot of stress, anxiety, and depression. So they needed a lot of psychological support. Poor and needy patients who come to hospital, they need a lot of help in terms of getting medicines free of cost, in terms of getting mutation testing, like beta catin mutation testing done and fab testing done, which are quite expensive. Also, awareness level about the disease is quite less and the treatment options are not very much clear. We then started making our WhatsApp group. Today, we have a heterogeneous WhatsApp group with around 200 patients. We can see in this picture that we India is a, a big country, populated country with so many states, and we have desmoid tumor patients coming from all parts of India with, with all the states almost occupied. Not only this, we also have international patients coming from Canada, Mauritius, Bangladesh, and Nepal. Now coming to the important point that how Triple S helps desmoid patients. So as we have mentioned, right from 2018, when our society got registered, we started going to hospital. We sit outside OPD, we meet desmoid tumor patients. Once they meet the doctor, they come out. We understand their concerns. We counsel them, educate them, and give them information sheets. These information sheets are prepared in English which are FAQs on fibromyosis and side effects faced due to Sora failure. We really want to thank Dr. Samir Astogi and Dr. Gautam who have been helping us in terms of preparing these information sheets. We have also got it translated in Hindi and the links are shared uh, here. Besides this, we have a 24 seven helpline number and a website where all desmoid patients can reach out to us from India and abroad and we connect them with the doctor. Once they meet the doctor and once the doctor prescribes whatever medicine is required to be taken. We then include them in our WhatsApp group and then new patients are requested to talk to the old patients who understand their concern and they help and support them and they provide the necessary emotional support. So how our support group helps just my patients. So as we have mentioned that we provide them moral support. We do their emotional counseling. We connect patients with the sarcoma specialist. We give them awareness. A lot of new patients are encouraged to talk to the old patients. Poor and needy patients are uh, given sorafenib. And not only this, patients who are unable to take the cost of their 
fab testing and beta catenin mutation testing done we try to arrange crowd funding so whenever we see any poor patient who is unable to bear the cost of the medicine we write this concern in our group and we have a lovely group of all desmoid patients who are now our volunteers they all contribute together but it is said that drop by drop makes an ocean so their small contributions together make contribution we are able to support our patients we organize desmoid support room meetings on a weekly basis to instill hope positivity and courage and we address their concerns in those meetings so we are going to present case studies so this is a picture of a patient and we have taken the picture and published here with his permission he is a patient from one state madhya pradesh in india he was diagnosed with desmoid in 2009 he is an amputee and he underwent nine surgeries in madhya pradesh now this patient had to undergo nine surgeries because he was doctors were unaware about his condition and had to operate him nine times when he came to aims doctor saw him and he was put up on sorafenib and multiple diagnostic tests were advised when he came outside he was in emotional trauma as a support room he we heard his concerns had a discussion with him and we arranged his sorafenib multiple number of times and also his diagnostic scans coming to the next case study this is another poor and needy patient who was from bihar he was a very poor patient who was advised of germline mutation testing for fap this is a hereditary condition and this patient was also not able to afford the cost of this the the cost of this in india was around 19000 we spoke to him understood his financial structure arranged his crowd funding requested all the desmoid patients to support him and all patients came forward they supported him unfortunately this patient could not survive and he was survived by his wife and his two sons after his demise we again arranged crowd funding for his son and got this test done so as a support group we have arranged we have helped him emotionally financially and administratively now many people ask what we do in our weekly support group meetings and what happens in our whatsapp group so in our support group meetings that we do every sunday at 4 pm on zoom we invite pathologists psychologists mental health pro advocates and doctors are invited they are requested to give a talk to educate patients guide them counsel them and impart education and the concerns of the patients are addressed also it's a platform that we create where new diagnosed patients are encouraged to talk to the old patients and all their stress anxiety depression that gets relieved in fact in our whatsapp group which is a very heterogeneous group new patients whenever they come the most common chats that come to our group is that i am on sorafenib i've got hot hand foot syndrome i have high bp what do i need to do my hair color is changing females say that i have irregularity in my periods and from where to get beta catenin mutation testing done from where to get fab done so all the new the old patients they educate the other patients and that is how they provide emotional support and give education to these patients and their stress anxiety gets relieved we are really thankful to our sister organization dtrf despoint tumor research foundation and life raft organization for educating us with information sheets but in order to support our desmoid patients or sarcoma patients or just patients we also need other partners like all these pharmaceutical companies have been providing funds they have been supporting us because of which we are able to do diagnostic scan sometimes free of cost and sometimes on discounted basis so in the last two years of pandemic we did not stop working we continue to provide support we have organized 96 patient support group meetings in the last two years of pandemic and we have organized various desmoid education programs and support group meetings i'm just sharing the uh, recent activity the recent support group meeting that we have done as desmoid education program on 29th august 2021 here dr samir astogi gave a talk on desmoid tumors and its treatment options what is required to be done dr pratibha amde gave a talk on role of beta catenin mutation testing in fibromyositis and ms priyanka khachi who is a desmoid patient advocate she's shared her journey mrs smita rao shared about her caregiver journey and i mentioned how support group can be helpful for supporting desmoid tumor patients these are some of the activities that we have been doing education program where dr samir astogi has been supporting and guiding and giving education to desmoid patients medicines have been given to poor and needy patients 
And along with that, many counseling sessions have been done and some support group meeting pictures have been shown from time to time that we have been doing. These are all desmoid patients who have been connected together virtually and they have been supporting each other. This is our Sachin Sarcoma support group. We believe in holding hands right from the time the patient is diagnosed till the patient gets cured. We make them, we make them realize that they are not alone and we are together with them in this journey. Now we're coming to the important point, what is our vision? So we are a support group with limited funds. And we believe that if we get more funds, we would be able to help more and more desmoid patients in our country. For this, we feel that we will, if we get funds, we will be organizing more awareness sessions to impart education. We will be having more motivation sessions as we have seen that desmoid patients have a lot of stress, anxiety, and depression. So more motivation sessions are required. We would be inviting more pathologists, doctors, psychologists, who would be able to address the concerns of patients. As we have already converted our information sheets into Hindi, because Hindi is a language spoken all over in India, we would also like to convert our information sheets in all regional languages. Working on more collaborations with other pharmaceutical companies, we will work on patient advocacy, reach out to government to support more desmoid patients. We will work for research to find a cure and we'll try to bring clinical trials to India. So a lot of things are going on in other countries, but clinical trials are still not in India. And once we get more funds, we would be able to get more manpower so that we can work on making structured database. Finally, we would like to really thank Spain for giving us this opportunity, DTRF for always being our sister organization and supporting us, Life Raft organization, Dr. Samir Astogi, who has been our true mentor, guide and supporter. Without his guidance, we would not have been able to do this. I would really like to thank Priyanka Khachi. Uh, she's our desmoid patient and who, she has been very helpful. Dr. Gautam, who has supported for our FAQs, Dr. Jigna, Dr. Supriti, all team members, and patients and caregivers for giving us the opportunity to help them. Thank you very much. If there are any, any questions, we would be happy to take it. Thanks a lot for your insight in your work. I think you really had a great achievement in the last years. So questions? Just a question from my side, is any of this medication uh, reimbursed in India? Sorry, any medication? It, is any medication reimbursed in India for the patients or on private insurance or something like that? Yeah, so uh, regarding Surafinib in India, we have a lot of generics available. We have at least five or six generics and the cost of generics is quite low. Like as compared to other drugs, it's like uh, 2000 rupees, which is like almost uh, uh, $30 or so for monthly. For month, Surafinib will cost in India around $30 and in fact, lesser than that. So it's 60, 70% of people can easily afford it. Then we have a lot of uh, like uh, the hospital provides few patients free of cost. So uh, though insurance is available only for a minority of patients, but yeah, for, for them, desmoid covers. I mean, for those who have insurance, these diseases are covered. Okay. Uh, here are a uh, few questions. How many typical typically attend the support meetings? So support room meetings are attended by around uh, 40, 40, 50 patients. We try to, we have a two hour slot and we try to have a target audience every time. We make a list beforehand. We tell the patients, we tell them that this is the guest speaker who will be coming and addressing the concerns. And that is how they come and attend session every Sunday. Okay. Uh, another question, how does the visit to hospitals to meet patient work? Uh, I could not understand the question, sorry. No, I'm, 
How does the visit to hospitals? Yeah, so we uh, visit hospital on a weekly basis. And uh, that is where we meet the desmoid tumor patients. And besides that, like other patients from all parts of India, they contact through our helpline number and website. And that is how we try to reach out to them and support them and then add them to our WhatsApp group. Okay. Thank you, Rashi. I wonder if there is a, a notification for you to, to, to know that there are uh, desmoid patients or something like that, or you visit freely once a week and and the, the patients in, who are there, you meet them and so on. So Dr. Samir also tells, and then we also visit and we meet the patient and uh, based on our interaction with them, then we come to know like how to, uh, what kind of support we need to provide them. Okay, thank you. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another question for Dr. Togi and Kaspar, what is known about extended TKI use in children? Not really much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the problem is we, we, we do not have studies there. That's, by the way, another, um, another um, advantage for the gamma secretase inhibitors. There's also a pediatric study ongoing, at least in the US. Um, so also testing these in the pediatric population. So there's a, actually a really separate study ongoing for that. I have a question for Dr. Kasper. So uh, we have been using, T since uh, many parents don't allow chemotherapy used in children. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they just say they are so afraid of chemotherapy and they somehow give consent for TKIs for okay. serafinib. And in India, since like, they are so cheaply available and uh, I mean, we can use in 40, 40 kg children or like 35 kg, we use them. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, we haven't seen any long term so far, three years, two years, we have used them. But in those people who refuse chemotherapy, what else do you use apart from gamma secretase? I mean, there are actually no other options than then um, if they do want, if they don't want chemotherapy then we also do only have the TKIs and um, the different TKIs and we usually use the ones with the higher response rates so rafinib, pisopinib, but um, that's it. I mean gamma secretase inhibitors are not really available until now and um, yeah, we hopefully will have them in the in the next couple of years. But 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 it it's interesting to hear that you that you use um, TKIs for children on on such a, let's say more or less regular basis. And uh, of course, the worry, as you already said, uh, is always about the long term side effects, which are not really well studied in also not in Europe. I mean, for GIST patients, for example, we do hardly have any good study on long-term side effects of imatinib. Um, that's a bit of a problem. And this is even more important in desmoids, who, uh, desmoid patients who have a more or less normal life experience. But interesting to hear that you should definitely follow up the patients here to see if there are any problems in the long term. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I, I asked that question because I've just heard from, heard a lot of anecdotes, right, around growth issues in children with TKI specifically. But I, I think like parents are too, like uh, chemotherapy has long-term toxicity, mutagenicity, carcinogenicity. So probably even chemotherapy is not holy grail, like TKIs we don't know but chemotherapy is also difficult to use in children. Any further question? So we are really in time. So thanks a lot to all speakers again and let us keep moving on with our great collaboration to hopefully find one day together a cure for desmoid tumor patients. And 
I have a few announcements for other events from the coma patients urine it. So do you have the slides, Michi? Just a second. Sure. So we have the medical and scientific highlights 2021 in bone sarcomas on March the 9th. At the same time, then we have medical and scientific highlights 2021 in soft tissue sarcomas on March 23rd. At the same time, always. And um, our SPAN conference is planned this year from the 24th to the 22nd of June as a hybrid meeting currently. And yeah, last but not least, thanks a lot to all of you for joining today and take care. And hopefully we will see us soon again, face to face. Thank you, Christina and everyone who participated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Take Bye. care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye.